Um, so welcome to this uh, webinar. I was going to talk a little bit this afternoon about some of the work we've done on mapping ecosystems uh, and particularly about how that helps identify service innovations. And this is one of the tools webinars that we are doing. So as well as providing regular updates on the research, we're also every so often uh, doing a webinar which revisits some of the older research and just talks about some of the tools, techniques that the Service Alliance has developed. So let me um, start by uh, just talking briefly about uh, the background to this work. So the original research on um, mapping ecosystems uh, really you have to start thinking about why ecosystems matter uh, in organizations. And if you think about some of the recent developments in uh, different types of organizations, uh, think about uh, Uber or TripAdvisor or Airbnb, uh, a number of them have been really very successful at building uh, quite sophisticated ecosystems where they don't, as an organization, provide all of the service themselves, but instead they co-opt other partners uh, into their ecosystem to make it work. So if you think about Uber, uh, Uber is an interesting model in that they have not invested in cars themselves. Instead, they've persuaded drivers to give their cars to, or effectively allow Uber to use their cars, and indeed the driver themselves provides the driver. Uh, and what Uber provides is a platform that enables that uh, ecosystem to operate. And you can see this in lots of different uh, walks of life. So Airbnb, same thing with accommodation, where increasingly Airbnb, rather than owning any physical uh, properties, any rooms, it effectively just matches customers or users of rooms with the provider of that accommodation. Um, so for us, when we think about ecosystems, we think about them as uh, networks of firms and organizations that can influence the way a focal firm creates and captures value. Uh, and that, that distinction between creates and captures value is important in this definition. Because what we're talking about is firms that are very deliberately designing an ecosystem that allows them to use their ecosystem partners to create value for the end customer, but also very deliberately thinks then about how they, as the focal firm, will capture uh, some of that value. So go back to Uber. Uh, Uber offers the service, offers the um, the platform, allows drivers to find passengers that would want to be driven around the place. Uh, and Uber takes a percentage of the fees that individual passengers pay, uh, and that's how Uber uh, makes it money, its money. Airbnb does the same thing for accommodation. So they've thought very carefully about who's creating the value and where the, capture, the value is captured in the ecosystem. And we also think increasingly about ecosystems as not just being traditional uh, supply chains, um, so suppliers and customers, um, but also the broader ecosystem. So you might think about different collaborators, uh, regulators, uh, and indeed in some cases the clients, uh, stakeholders and customers. And particularly in the business to business world, so both the Uber and the Airbnb example clearly are, are more business to consumer, particularly in the business to business world, these ecosystems become incredibly complicated. Uh, so an example we often talk about is Portsmouth uh, Maritime Services, BAE Systems, where BAE is collaborating with Babcock and Aramark and the local Ministry of Defense to deliver value. But actually, they, they compete with Babcock and a different contract just down the road. So you end up with these really quite complex uh, inter-organizational relationships. The reason these things matter so much is that when you are very sophisticated and think carefully about how you create and capture value, uh, you can create very successful business models. So take Apple. Apple traditionally has had an incredibly closed ecosystem. Um, it's got its own platform, it's got its own software and so on. But the one bit of the Apple ecosystem that's incredibly open is the App Store. And part of the reason for that, of course, is that you can get lots of people to develop apps. So there's all sorts of training materials, there's all sorts of guides out there on the net about how you might develop apps yourself. Um, anyone can register to be an apps developer. Big advantage of uh, having lots of people registered as apps developers is that you can end up with um, enormous numbers of people uh, who then um, uh, develop the apps, make them available in the Apple Store, but of course that in turn drives down the cost of individual apps and makes the platform uh, 
the laptop, the iPhone, more valuable to the customer, partly because of the route to access all of those apps. So we see those examples in the business to consumer world, uh, but actually you can see them in the business to business world as well. So uh, some of you may have come to Service Week a couple of years ago where we had GE talk, and GE um, have in some ways, uh, well, they've been very public about their desire to, to try and own the industrial internet or the internet of things. Um, and they've launched this platform called Predix. Uh, and Predix is a, a platform a bit like the Apple iStore, um, but it's a platform where business to business apps are being uploaded. Uh, and independent developers, again, can produce apps that allow people to use bits of capital equipment more effectively, upload their apps to the, the Predix platform, and of course the data that comes from some of those apps also then ends up flowing through at the GE platform. So GE's gone for a model saying, why don't we build a platform a bit similar to uh, Apple that will allow us to capture uh, the business to, or the Internet of Things. The Understanding or so clearly understanding your ecosystem and thinking about it uh, carefully, you can think very uh, carefully about how you manage to capture uh, and create value as Apple's tried to do or has successfully done as GE is seeking to do with credits. But there are flip sides to this as well. So uh, some of our work shows that actually failing to understand the ecosystem can also have quite significant consequences for firms. And one of my favorite uh, examples of this is uh, Michelin. So Michelin, some years ago, introduced a tire um, uh, called the Run Flat Tire. Um, this was a tire that um, was described as the biggest innovation in tire technology uh, in nearly 60 years. Um, and basically, it, the value proposition was that with, with this Run Flat Tire, you could, uh, as a customer, uh, drive quite happily for another 125 miles, 55 miles an hour, even if the tyre was flat. Um, so, uh, in useful uh, technological, uh, safer for the customers and so on. Uh, Michelin did a great job in terms of uh, managing the ecosystem. So they persuaded uh, auto manufacturers, particularly Honda, to adopt this new technology and to install it on all new cars. They also persuaded their competitors, so people like Sumitomo, uh, one of the biggest alternative uh, manufacturers of tires, that they should adopt the same technology. And so if you think about uh, what Honda's done, they've got a, a value proposition for the customer, a safer tire, if you get a flat tire you can run 125 miles, they've got the car manufacturer supporting it, they've got their biggest competitor supporting it. You think they've done a really got, good job of building uh, the ecosystem. But when they launched this tire, um, it was a disaster. And it was a disaster for um, a very simple reason. And the simple reason was that uh, the specialist equipment needed to replace these tires, uh, few, relatively few garages decided to buy that equipment. So uh, to replace this PAX tire, the run flat tire, uh, you needed particular tooling in the garage. Uh, a number of garages said, we're not investing in that tooling. So that when customers got uh, flat tires, uh, went into the garage with their car with a flat tire, garage response was, really sorry, uh, we don't have the equipment to replace that tire, uh, but we can sell you four of the old types of tires, the classic radial tires, install those in your car instead, and you won't have this problem in the future. Um, of course, the customers got incredibly frustrated, and it resulted in a class action suit uh, being filed against Michelin and Honda in the US. Um, uh, by a number of uh, frustrated customers. So it's a really interesting example of where, at one level, you'd think Honda had thought carefully about the ecosystem, but that actually relatively small firms, individual garages, um, and relatively small players in the ecosystem, because of their collective, not deliberate, but because of their collective action that all resulted in the same thing and not having the equipment, then the ecosystem failed uh, once Honda launched the, uh, the car. So. Uh, while there are pros to understanding ecosystems, there are also uh, cons if you don't uh, get it right for the organization. And then uh, certainly some of the work we've been doing, uh, we think that understanding ecosystems is not just about creating and capturing value, but there's also something about using your understanding of the ecosystem to bring about potential for innovation. 
So thinning, uh, one of the caterpillar dealers in the UK is where we did some of this work originally, and we were testing with them a methodology for mapping ecosystems. And in thinning, uh, the challenge they faced was uh, independent maintainers of capital equipment. So the, the, the model here, imagine you've got a Volvo car, uh, you can choose to drive your Volvo car to the garage, uh, the Volvo garage and get it repaired, or you can choose to drive your car to uh, an independent garage, uh, and we call uh, the independent garage uh, Bob. So small, cheap and cheerful garage. Bob only uses uh, genuine uh, Volvo parts when he needs to, uh, doesn't uh, do a full service if he doesn't need to, but will do what he needs to do to keep your car on the road. And lots of people over time choose to go to Bob uh, rather than uh, the Volvo garage. Well, Finnings face the same problem. So uh, lots of their customers will go to the, the equivalent of Bob, the independent maintainer. Uh, many of the Bobs have been trained by Finnings, so they used to work for Finnings as technicians. They've left, they've set their own company up, and they've gone off and uh, built these independent uh, carriages. And the, uh, the firms themselves uh, have then, uh, Finning effectively built its own competition. And for years, uh, Finning has, has hated Bob uh, and, and wanted rid of them and just thought Bob's a pain. Uh, they, Bob takes the labor and the part sales from Finning. Uh, it would be much better if Bob didn't exist. But we were using ecosystem mapping to say to Finning, well, let's think differently about how you might use or how you might engage with Bob. And the question effectively we posed, what do you do about Bob? And when you start to think about the ecosystem, and you start to think about how you might change, for example, a competitor into a customer or into a collaborator, some interesting things arise. So one of the possible innovations we talked about was uh, rather than Finning viewing Bob as the uh, competitor, why not think about providing a service to Bob? So if Finning and Caterpillar are remotely monitoring vehicles, uh, they're gathering data from those vehicles in terms of the health of the vehicle, the state of the engine, and so on, they then can diagnose some of the problems with vehicles. When they see the vehicle going from the construction site to uh, Bob's uh, garage, they can, say to, uh, they can call Bob and say, look, Bob, we know the vehicle's coming to you because we can see from the GPS position it's moving towards your garage. We know what's wrong with that vehicle because we've been remotely monitoring it. We've got all of the spare parts that you might need to repair the vehicle. Would you like us to ship the spare parts to you along with the installation instructions and the diagnostics data, uh, and then you can install them? If they do that, Finning still lose the labor sale, but at least they secure the part sale. Previously, they may have lost both sales, um, so they, they secure the part sale. And of course, by building a deeper relationship with Bob, when Bob gets faced with an engine overhaul, a big job that Bob can't do, Bob is much more likely to recommend that work to Finning and say, or recommend Finning as the provider and say, you really should take that work to Finning. So you can change the, the nature of the ecosystem. It raises another interesting question for Finning. If you, if you go down that route, how many workshops does Finning need? Because you can have a load of Bobs, provided you can deal with quality control and issues like that. You can have a load of local Bobs, uh, all of whom did the maintenance of equipment for you and you could actually afford to close some of your own local workshops and reduce the operating cost of, of your business. So there are there are different models that you might come up with when you start to think about uh, potential for innovation across the ecosystem. So the process we've developed for mapping ecosystems um, is really a, a straightforward one, it's a 12-step process. So the first thing in thinking about ecosystem is to define uh, the boundaries of the ecosystem, and particularly, 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 particularly the what are you going to do about Bob or equivalent question? You know, why do I want this ecosystem? The second uh, step is then to think about the different customers uh, in the ecosystem, and you're thinking there both about your direct customers and indeed your uh, customers' customers, and you might go all the way to the end uh, consumer of the, the product or the service. You then start to think about a broader set of ecosystem actors, and you ask yourself the question, who else is involved in this ecosystem that can influence the way that we as the focal firm uh, create and indeed capture value? Uh, and so that's where you start to think about other collaborators, about regulators, about competition, and so on. Um, fourth step, you start to cluster those ecosystem actors. And then once you've got that initial listing, uh, we tend to do something uh, Step five about developing actor IDs, 
And this is really describing in a little more detail the role of each of those actors in the ecosystem. And so we think about what's their value proposition, so what do they bring to the ecosystem? Uh, how do they do it, so what's the value delivery system? And particularly what they do themselves and what they ask others to do. And then the third question is about what risk they take. So uh, in the language we've often used in service lines, the accountability spread, what risk is that actor exposed to? Once you've done that, you've got a good mapping of the ecosystem. Um, and then it's interesting to start to think about actually how the income uh, both flows into the ecosystem and then how it splits across actors in the ecosystem. So how is the value captured uh, inside that ecosystem? And likewise, the cost. What's the, the cost base of the ecosystem? So you get a financial flow for the ecosystem. Clearly not all value is financial, um, but the financial flow is an interesting way to look at it. And then once you've got that complete picture, you can start to think about those opportunities for ecosystem innovation. So what if I moved Bob from being a competitor to a customer? How might I re rethink my uh, value proposition, the way I create value uh, and capture value for this ecosystem? And then you're into a phase of prioritizing those uh, innovation opportunities and thinking about the, the change process that goes with that. So how do I identify uh, the changes required to realize those opportunities. And then the 12th step, um, particularly thinking about co-innovation and co-adoption, as you're thinking about the ecosystem innovation, you have to ask the question, who else needs to make innovations and indeed adopt these changes to make this particular innovation stick? And that's why the Michelin example is so useful, because what Michelin didn't do is think carefully enough about all of the co adoption actors and particularly the garages and because they miss the garages and they need to take new technology they ended up with an ecosystem innovation that didn't work. So there are then some um, patterns that come from this and you can think about different types of ecosystem and we've uh, talked about three in the alliance. So, so one model for ecosystems and this particularly links into platforms is to think about um, the ecosystem uh, with uh, effectively indirect um, effect. So think about someone like Amazon. Effectively, Amazon, as the dominator or the keystone, provides the platform. Users uh, of the ecosystem, users of the platform, go and search for books or equipment or materials and so on. Uh, and then the providers uh, provide materials to Amazon, which Amazon uh, markets on the platform. But then when you place the order, the provider delivers directly to the user. Um, and so there's not a direct interaction between end user and provider other than in the delivery phase of the, of the first uh, kind of model of ecosystem. A an alternative way of thinking about the model would be to say, well, actually, you can think about ecosystems with both direct and indirect effects. Uh, and so Facebook's a good example here. So at one level, Facebook does the same thing. It connects providers uh, with users. So you think about the games that are on Facebook or the advertisements on Facebook. But part of Facebook's value, particularly to the users, uh, relies on the direct network effects, the facts that the fact that people think th things keep happening uh, or users are providing content that other users value. So you end up with this uh, more direct interaction between uh, the individual users. And then a third uh, model that we've seen around ecosystems is the, if you like, the integrator, moderator and integrator. So uh, someone like Innocentive is a good example here. So Innocentive offers a service where um, users of the Innocentive platform come along and say, we would like somebody to come up with a new design for two-page tube or uh, a new way of um, making a, a glue or whatever it might be. They will pose some innovation challenge. They'll keep it anonymous because they'll pose it to Innocentive and Innocentive will launch that innovation challenge out to the wider community. And the providers here are people providing ideas about how you might solve that um, uh, challenge uh, that's been posted. They provide their ideas back to Innocentive who in turn feed them back to the users. So you end up there with a different set of relationships. And so when you're looking at uh, innovation across the ecosystem, you can also think about how I'm trying to create different models of ecosystems and particularly the role that the platform that might play in the ecosystem. So that, um, I hope, is a useful and relatively quick summary of some of the work that we've been doing on uh, ecosystems over the years.